But apparently my two clients aren't the only ones who do it, right? This has apparently been a, a, a friendship scheme. It's, it's working together to help all the clients, right? There's, there's more refund, the, the, the clients who get the earned income credits are happy, they're getting more refunds because they need the 1099 to get to that sweet spot. And the people who issue the 1099s, they're saying, it's just one of how many other 1099s we issue. How are we ever going to get caught? Yes? You have a, a doctor who is a true independent contractor, and he gives you his 1099s totals. And you say, no, no, I need your bank statements. Because the 1099s may not cover all the people who sent you checks. Sure. Second, I said to him, can I see the deposit tickets? Why? Well, don't, doesn't some of your people have co-pays? They give you cash? Oh, you're going to report the co-pays now? Oh my God! It doesn't pay to be a doctor anymore if i got to report all the co-pays. Don't you know what the insurance companies are already short me? You want me to pay up tax on the co-pay? What do you, the IRS or the return prepare? Cash isn't reportable. <laughs> We're in Bergen County. We're on the cash is not income method of accounting. Right. right? <laughs> so. Here, here. All right, for those of you who don't, I am only kidding. There is no cash is not income basis just for Bergen County. It's all of New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but, back to. Somebody's going to come in and the guy in here. security. Yeah. I put a zero, 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 zero. Yes. That's okay, right? Yes. Why is that okay? And it is okay, but if you go to the Social Security website, it tells you it's okay. And I pay the... Uh, you pay. And you keep records. You know why you keep records? Because just because you're undocumented and here without status today, doesn't mean you're going to be undocumented and here without status in five years. There is a procedure called unscrambling Social Security earnings where if a person is undocumented and Social Security is paid on their behalf, when they do get their green card, right, and when they will be able to get credit for all of those Social Security taxes paid on their behalf. So if you are counseling undocumented workers, that you're going to tell them to save all of their W-2s and all of their information because there is a procedure to go back and get them taken care of, right? So um, we'll, we'll talk about, I, I'm, I may touch it, I mean there's a lot to talk about this in this process here, but you shouldn't shy away from filing returns for the undocumented reclassifying them as employees, making sure that they get their credit, right? The IRS used to have on its website that they are not Homeland Security, all right? The IRS's mission is to collect the correct amount of tax. They're going to collect the correct amount of tax whether your job is to be a broker on Wall Street or whether you're working uh, as a member of organized crime, Al Capone, he had to pay tax on his illegal money. Drug dealers pay tax on his earning. Undocumented workers pay tax on his earnings, right? The IRS doesn't discriminate as to how you make your money. They don't even care how you make your money, right? One of our cases involved a contract killer, right? You know, he had to pay tax on the money he earned, right? The IRS was his partner in good times. Uh, so, Count the bullets. Right? So, you, you never shy away from compliance with the law. With, and then we'll worry about the consequences when it happens. Yes? Frank, while you're right about the IRS, um, right now, those undocumented workers have probably committed a felony by using a full social security number. Now, if they show up and mm -hmm. say, hey, I committed this felony, but I want my refund, my guess is there's a pretty good chance they're going to get deported before they get the refund. Absolutely not. There is a chief counsel memorandum. I think, did I, was it in the material? There's a chief counsel memorandum that says, even though you earned your money on a false W-2, right, that you gave this, the Social Security number to the employer, right, what you need to do is file a 4552 substitute for W-2. Report the income using the TIN, even though the TIN, the ITIN number, is not permissible for work. 
your historians, your reporting income that was earned, and the IRS's disclosure laws kick in, 6103, and the government will not give it to any other agency. I mean, and so there's a legal opinion from the Office of Chief Counsel that guides us all and protects you. It says that your jobs as tax professional, our jobs as tax professional, is to ensure compliance with the tax laws, right? You can't change history. The money was earned. Whether the taxpayer was in the country with status or without status when he earned the money, once it's been earned, it has to be reported. The historian don't have a right to change the facts. So you will file a return for that taxpayer. You will get an ITIN for that taxpayer to ensure that you haven't misled the government in any way as to who the person was that earned the money, right? Because the assignment of income doctrine, Lucas versus Earl, income is taxed to the people that earn the money. And that employee should not be in trouble with the government because he has discharged his obligations. The IRS will not disclose that information to third parties because Section 6103 makes it a felony to disclose to other agencies unless you meet certain specified exceptions, right? And that's why the other agencies sometimes hate working with the IRS because the IRS is bound by the disclosure laws to only release information if there is an exception to the disclosure laws that apply. How many 6110 doesn't apply. What? 6110 doesn't apply. 6103. 6110. Now, 60, there's a section, 6103, that is the anti-disclosure laws. It came in during the Nixon administration. But how many then, Forever, tax return information is tax return information, right? Unless there's an exception, the IRS does not disclose it. It is, it is felt that that is necessary to encourage voluntary compliance mm -hmm. and uh, self-assessment, right? The, one of the problems with tax enforcement today, the professionals who've been in tax compliance forever, Hey, that you're adding all of these programs to what the IRS's core mission has been, to make people politicize the Internal Revenue Service and, and politicize what the hardworking employees at the IRS do, right? What do the people at the IRS do? They want to collect the correct tax, right? Do they want to collect your student loan debt? Do they want to collect child support? Do they want to be involved in the Affordable Care Act? No. Why? Because it, it, the public then vents their anger at the people at the IRS who really only have one job, to collect the correct tax. It's a, not a political job. It is a service that a, Congress spends the money. All the IRS does is collect it, but then the people that are elected by all of us decide how that money gets spent. And that's the way it has traditionally always been. And to encourage that, to encourage the self-assessment and voluntary compliance, 6103 says to the American people, when you give information to the Internal Revenue Service, you can know that it is confidential. 7216 says to the preparer community, when you give your preparer information, to file a tax return. That preparer is not free to give it out to anyone else, right? It's a crime. That's why you've gotten all your 7216 notices. It's a crime to give it to anybody else. They, they've given you privilege, 7525, that says when you're doing the tax returns, if it's a civil case, you guys have the same privilege that lawyers do so that people feel free to ask you your advice as to the correct way to report and how to defend. So, I mean, that's the way our system works. There's confidentiality at the IRS level. There's punishment for tax preparers who violate their oath of confidentiality to the system. So, although no one in this room is going to condone you know, illegal, being in the country without status and working without status, and that crime, what we have to remember is 
We get the information after it's all done. We're historians. We have no ability to change the fact that the money was earned, it must be reported, and tax is paid. And you know something? In the majority of these cases, the people make so little money that they're entitled to refunds anyway. So the big scam is by taking these people's money and not giving them their refunds, because Taxpayer Bill of Rights says that you only pay the correct tax, not more and not less. Your status is irrelevant to what the correct tax is. Yes? Yes, Diane. I have a question for you. When somebody comes in and abuse someone else's Social Security and then someone asks back here, mm -hmm. we have an I-10. Right. You just said to use the substitute return instead of your original W-2 and the old. Correct. Social that's what the IRS instructions say. Okay. How does the IRS know the credit coming from the employer? Because you've told them where the original one was, but you've used the 45 uh, for 4852 to transfer it, right? They got the money from the employer. So you never have to put the, the fake Social Security? You're never using the fake Social Security number. Yes. Frank, that's not 100% correct. Most of your tax software requires you to put the W-2 in with the Social Security number as it appears in the W-2. Yes. And there's a field where you put in... The ITIN. Right, the, the ITIN. So you do have to report the number that it's on. Oh, yeah, yes. You're not paying tax on that number. That's right. That's that's that, that tax-wise and all those programs do that. That's a software issue. That's a software issue. It's not the W-2. Is that no, it's... Look, there was a time when... I mean, right. now we're going to go back three years, right, in history. There were times when this mismatch issue required you to paper file, okay? I think it was three years ago, right, that the software companies started creating the fix where you could actually put the fake W-2 in, right, because you're downloading it electronically. And then it will port over to the 4852 with the right item. So the front page of the tax return is the right item. The information is going to the IRS to be credited to the right account. That's going to facilitate then Social Security getting the information that they're going to credit to the right ITIN. But you're not filing the false, you're not relying on the false W-2 for the computation of tax, right? That's how the Chief Counsel memo skirted the issue of whether or not you were involved in another crime, right? You're reporting it under the correct number. The, the 1040 has the correct item. Right? Thank you, John. Uh, all right. So now let's get to the point. Well, five minutes to the break. Let me start the point, right? So all of this, we've got all of this. You've got an employee or you've got an independent, uh, an independent contractor. They have a question about status. So either the employee or the firm can file the SSA. And the SSA is a document that asks you the question and forces you to ask the questions, right? And before we go through the SSA, I'm going to call your attention to a revenue ruling 8741, right? 8741 is a site. The same way 5960 is cited for valuation. Uh, 8741 is cited for how to interpret the factors when you're doing an, uh, an SSA. It's a very short revenue ruling. It's easy to read. Before you do an SSA, I would always have it next to you, right? Because it's going to help you, right? We're, this month's newsletter has, the article in this month's newsletter is how to prepare an SSA. And I go through each one of these questions and how the factors come out and maybe give you some of the cases. So you'll, you'll have your 8741, you'll pull this month's article on how to prepare an SSA as your desk version. So you'll have a summary of the law because every question has some nuance and how you answer the question affects the ultimate uh, conclusion, right? There's actually software out there now, and I, I don't have the name of the program. Um, we, we had it, we haven't used it in, uh, in a while, that you put in all of the factors and it will give you its guess of is the IRS gonna come out independent contractor or employee, right? So because it's just adding up the factors on how you answer the questions, you can always 
play with the program by nuancing the answers till you get to the result that you want, right? You can't change the facts, but you can be advocates. So, and that's how I'm gonna, and where that line is, is due diligence. So, this is the break. All right, so we're gonna take a break now and then we're gonna go over the form. Going over the SSA, okay? Fallacy about forms. Everybody thinks it's like forms is just about filling in a box, right? Every question has nuances. Every question can be read a couple of different ways. So think about when you are filling out the form, think of it as a negotiation, right? Think about it as if you were having a spirited argument, okay? Um, and because, you know, that's what it is. The, when the answers suit the government's position, then they deem the answers to be admissions. When, on the other hand, when they are inconsistent with the government's position, they think of them as just the position of this person who's submitting it, right? So think about the way that the person at the other side of the table is gonna read it. All inferences when you're answering this question should go in favor of your client and the position that they are. The answers have to literally be true, but sometimes a literally true answer without further explanation can be misleading, all right? So when every question that they ask is, you've got to think through, all right? So who's filling out the form, right? Is it the firm or the worker, right? And that, that's generally not going to be that is much of a problem. Why are you filing the form, all right? That's a big thing if you want confidentiality, all right? The IRS, usually when the worker files the form, the IRS is going to allow the firm to put in its position, all right? There are going to be times where that's not gonna be in your client's interest, right? One, hey, is your client a whistleblower? Is he or she looking for a reward? If you're doing that and you're filing an SSA in connection with a 211, the IRS will give the whistleblower, the person who's applying for the reward, the confidentiality that you get under the reward program. That only happens if you put it up front. And in the materials, in the article that's coming out, I'm giving you the IRM section that says that the IRS, that you can file a whistleblower claim, right? If you know that a firm is intentionally misclassifying people in order to save tax, right? And you've got proof of that. Maybe there's something, you're, you're working inside the firm, you know that they got an opinion that says they shouldn't be doing it this way. Or they're paying people off the books that should be treated as employees, right? That's gonna be a good whistleblower complaint. If you look at the, the U.S. Attorney's website, there are more and more of employment tax cases being brought than ever before, right? And why is that one? Because, you know, the numbers have gone up. $61 billion disappearing. It's $61 billion disappearing. It's not like chump change anymore. Uh, and two, voluntary compliance, as we know, is important for the $3.5 trillion that came in from the honest taxpayers. So not prosecuting the dishonest taxpayer right, it undermines the confidence uh, that the right taxpayers, that the honest taxpayers doing the right thing, one, because it's the right thing to do, and two, because punishment for not doing the right thing will be swift and short, all right? So if you can file them for whistleblowers, just make sure that you put it up front so that the IRS doesn't inadvertently send the name of the whistleblower to the firm, all right? Total number of people that have performed the same amount of service, right? The more number of people that are involved, the more interested the IRS gets, right? So when you're doing it from the firm, every employee, everybody's misclassified. Frank's misclassified. He should be a lawyer too. The employer controls him, right? When you're representing the employee, employer, right, everybody's got a different task. How many people do the task that this one guy does? He's unique. There's only one of them. All right. So even the number of people. All right. Then you go through next question. How did you get your job? All right. 
Do employees bid for the job? Oh, I'll do it for seven dollars an hour. I'll do it for eight dollars an hour. Right? Do you do an RFP for the job? Right? Bid is going to be independent contractor. Employment agency, by its name, employment agency. Right? So even that, right? How you answer those simple questions may affect your result. Right? Copies of the supporting documents. This is where you say to yourself, mm, I didn't file W-2s, 1099s, or anything. I've just been keeping all the money. Can I continue to do that? <clears throat> or do I want to file one of these forms that says I didn't do anything? Right? Employer or employee, you want to look at this stuff, right? And contracts are also very important, right? Because contracts, in many ways, although it is an issue determinative, and just having a contract that says, I'm an independent contractor, doesn't cut it. They are important, and we're going to go over, for, for some of the lawyers in the room, when you're drafting a contract, or there the people who are advising companies, what should be in every contract today? Um, all right, so again, you're going to do some due diligence and look at the copies of the contracts. Okay. Next, describe the firm's business. Before you do that, and before you listen to what the taxpayer tells you, what are you going to do first? Google it. Google it. You're going to go to the website. How can you say somebody's an independent contractor when on the website it says he's the president of the company? <laughs> right? Because by definition, officers are employees of the company. We're going to get there. But there's a statute that says that. Again, that'll be in the article that we're doing. There are certain people that are going to be employees no matter what, as a matter of law. Right? Corporate officers. They're not independent contractors. Right? So, first step in my trust but verify when you're doing this work. Go out, look at the website. Now, can you change the website? Well, you can always correct a mistake. Right? So, uh, part what? You can press a button on the side and you can change the prior... Uh, oh, there's the way back machine. So, something is wrong today. I can't fix it. I know. But of course, there's the way back machine. Of course, I, we're historians. But if we find, because we're doing this, that there's a mistake, you fix the mistake. Right? If you see somebody drowning by the, in the water, you're going to say, oh, I didn't tell him to jump in, so now he's got to suffer. You help it. You make it better. That's what tax people do. We make things better. All right. Two. <laughs> We're good. We wear the white hat. Except for the people that Sal represents. Because Sal represents return preparers that are in trouble. Where are you, Sal? Right? There's Sal. If you're a bad return preparer, you're one of his clients. Uh, and if you're a bad return preparer, you need some. Okay. Uh, did you get paid for more than one entity, right? That, like, so you, the company merged and you stayed on. And they kept paying you. Or the company was sold and you got a bonus. Do you give your independent contract as the bonus? Your delivery guy, all right? Uh, is he getting a bonus when you sell your company? Your lawyer, right? I've been your faithful lawyer for years. I saw you in good times and bad. So now you're selling, you have your liquidity event. You're thinking, hey, Frank needs a bonus. Yeah. I should be thinking Frank needs a bonus, but I'm thinking, oh, there's another client, he's closing down. Hopefully we have a great party, right? Uh, it's a great party, it's champagne, it's go with God. Uh, but, <laughs> so, they, they look at that, right? If they stay on when the business is sold, if they got a bonus payment when the business is sold, that's going to be indicative of employee rather than independent contractor, right? Because the new person wants them. If the new person wants them, that means he's probably integral to the business, that there is some permanence. And those are going to be part of the tests that you look at. And 
All right. Describe the work done by the worker and the work job time. All right. One. The, this is where you got to be creative, right? You, you go back to this after you've done all the other questions. All right. And two, titles, although not issue determinative, can be admissions, right? Being a corporate officer, that's going to be admission. So again, be careful with titles. Be careful with title inflation, right? Some companies just give titles to everybody, right? Instead of giving them money, they give them a title. Well, but you don't give independent contractors titles, right? Uh, because then you, you have the risk of that person being an employee. So think about that. Check for the titles. And then go back at the end. After we do everything else, talk about what they do or they don't. Because you're going to, when you give the description, probably you're just going to describe the things that help your position. If you're the firm, the why they're, the, the, you're going to give the things they do that make them independent contractors. If you're the employee, you're going to put the, on the, the things that make you an employee. So you're going to do, again, there's advocacy in the way you write the answer. One position or another. See, this is your opportunity to sell your case. All right, practical. The IRS has a lot of private lenders. People write in all of the time for rulings. Right on this SSA, they issue private letter rulings. You can get to the private letter rulings. Right, we all have research skills. But there's a free service, right? LegalBitstream.com, where it's got all of the IRS materials. You just go to www.legalbitstream.com. For those, of you, it's on the you know on the web page on the Google group. We've put all the free legal services for tax and how to do tax research. Legal Bitstream is one of them, right? And you just go to the IRS information and you look at the revenue of the private letter rooms. You take the one that's closest to yours, right? And then you copy and paste and change the names, right? This. Uh, no, and then you, you, you monitor and you write and you make it well. But this isn't plagiarism. This is analyzing the factors. So the you, you see on private letter rulings how the IRS is analyzing the factors. So you find the private letter ruling that's the closest to your case and the position you want, and you start with that as your template, and then you edit as appropriate. Right? And for those of you on the Google group this weekend, I put on like how to write like a lawyer, right? Common sense, but how to write. Because writing is how you communicate with the IRS, how you get persuasive. And good writing can change the outcome of a case. Bad writing can make the IRS think that this guy is an idiot. He can't even put two sentences together. Right? And that's the rap that some uh, return preparers get. Like they care about the way the numbers look, but not the writing. So when you're writing this piece, you know, one, how do you convince a decision maker to go your way? You want to sound like the decision maker. So if you start with the private letter rulings, they're going to read it. They may know it's plagiarized. They may not know it's plagiarized. But if they don't, they say, wow, that sounds a lot like me. That guy's smart. He sounds like me. <laughs> right? And, and it gives you a structure that you will avoid, you know, your grammar mistakes. And then I always tell you, get a grammar checking software program. Those of you who work alone, right, uh, you don't have the benefit of another person reading your work. And so you want to get one of the four grammar checking programs I, I recommend in the article. Because one, it checks your grammar. Two, it reads it back to you so you could hear it yourself, right? And that'll make your writing better. Okay. What's writing? Where can they find those? I did an article this week. I go on the Google group, look at what I go. So if you, you see, you gotta get back to doing homework. Get back on a horse. Get back on the horse. Uh, there was a, there was an article this week. That the, in this month's newsletter, there's going to be the article on how to prepare everything you're hearing today. We're putting into the newsletter this month. Plus, on the Google group, there was an article about legal writing and how to make your writing better. It included the software programs. Okay. Um, all right. Written agreement. All right. We're going to go through it, and then if there's a written agreement, you're going to attach it. And then, again, there's some slides later on what 
how to write the agreements. Uh, training, okay. Now, training is, is it an independent contractor versus an employee, right? The training and instruction are important. You're an independent contractor. I hire you to prepare a tax return for me. Do I have to train you on the tax law? No, you're an independent contractor. You're supposed to know the minimums of your trade. You know, I'm not gonna teach a lawyer the law. I'm not gonna teach a doctor how to diagnose me. But on the other hand, if I do train, that means the control. If I'm training, it means I want to tell you how it's gonna be done and how you should do it. So training goes back to control. But what is training? Right? Then you have to think about what is training. Right? The FedEx drivers to, to train you on you know, saying yes sir, no sir, or am I training you on a skill that's necessary for your profession? Right? So you think about what training means in the context of the specific service provider. And then that's how you answer that question. How do you receive your work assignments? Right? If I'm giving you the work and saying it's gotta be done in an hour, you're more likely to be an employee because I'm exercising the control. If I give you your assignments and say, you know, I want that, I want you to do this real estate closing for me, all right? I'm not telling you how to do the real estate closing, what documents need to be done. I'm buying a building, Frank, I want you to do a closing, right? So you analogize the way you get assignments to whether it's an independent contract or employee. Is the service provider allowed to exercise some judgment? Right. Who determines the methods by which it's done, right? If the worker determines it, he's an independent contractor, right? If I tell, if you say, you know, give me a, a real estate closing or try my tax case, I'm gonna make judgment calls, right? You're giving me one instruction, I wanna win. I don't wanna pay tax, I want a refund. Right? Is that like determining how I do it? No. You just have a goal. Right? Client has a goal. Pay less tax. Uh, if, on the other hand, you want to tell the lawyer how to do everything. Right? This, that. And he's got to listen to you. Then it's more likely that that's an in house lawyer that's working for you. All right? Again, who do you contact if there's a problem? Right? If it's my business, if there's a problem, you're going to contact me. If it's somebody, right? Because the buck stops here. If on the other hand, you know, the employee screws up and they're going to contact the, the person who owns the company, then they're an employer. All right? Employee versus employer, right? Reports that are required, right? Status reports. That's going to be an employee, tells you what's going on with the day. I mean, but on the other hand, you know, some independent contractors, you know, lawyers, accountants, doctors, what's going on with my case, what's, you know, so again, that's a spin, that's a negotiation. What is the report? You know, are the bills a report, right? So again, work routine and setting the hours. You know, that's, that's a tough one now too in today's day and age. In the old days, it was always, if you set the hours and where they had to do the work, then they were definitely employees. That was before telecommuting, or flex place, and flex time. I mean, you can still have a flexible work schedule and be an employee, and work from home and be an employee. So that's, on that, you know, if you're looking for employer, uh, employee treatment, you're gonna say they set it all, right? But when you're, you're looking for independent contractor treatment, you talk about the realities of work today. That being at the location, again, is, shouldn't be an issue determinative factor. Again, where do you do the services? Generally, if you, if you have to do them at the employer's business location, that's definitely gonna be an employee. Right? If you can do them from home, if you can choose where you're gonna do them, but again, uh, right, the FedEx ground case that we talked about earlier, if they say you gotta do it on this route, then they're telling you where you gotta do it. If you're the FedEx driver, you gotta do it where the package has to go. But this is a technological can, control. This is not a 
traditional control. You know, they yeah. different. So the theory is, and you know, that's actually a very interesting theory because the government has a theory that the control is the act. That the employer is the guy who owns the application that tells you when to go. So even though the independent contractor decides when to go on the app, right? You're going to log into your Uber and get your assignment, or that once you log in, the app controls you, and that control is what makes you an employee, right? I'm not telling you I buy the theory 100%. I'm just giving you the government's theory. The app controls us all. Um, if you, are you required to attend meetings, right? If an employee, if somebody says, I gotta go someplace, I gotta attend this meeting, you know. And I'd say, I'm not going. I'm an independent contractor. If I'm not going, I'm gonna be fired. Maybe I'm an employee. I could be an independent contractor as well. But so you, that's again how you, you spin it and answer the question. Right? Is the worker required to provide the services personally? That's big, right? Because if I'm, if I'm going to take a job that I could have other people do the job, that means I have my own business. I'm independent. I can subcontract. On the other hand, if you say, Frank has to do it himself, nobody else, right? That's more likely than not going to be an employee. All right, you can differentiate it, right? Sometimes you're going to say, hey, I'm going to hire that law firm. I came to that law firm for that lawyer. The retainer agreement is going to have that. Make him an employee. It's only one of the factors, but it's part of the spin. So it's part of the thinking through how you're answering the questions and how you're going to bring it back to your analysis of all of the factors and the totality of the circumstances on the control or not control behavior control. Who hires them? Who pays the substitutes? If I'm sick and I gotta send somebody else to do the work, who pays them, right? You pay me, I pay them, then I'm probably independent. Right, if you pay them, then they're probably an employee. Okay, um, who pays the substitutes, right? That's all part of the hiring and firing and control. Who controls the person that provides the services? Who pays for the supplies and equipment, right? If you are an employee, you come into a factory, there's a machine, you're gonna, you're gonna work on the machine, you're more likely the employee, somebody else has bought the equipment. On the other hand, if you bring your own tools, and you have to invest in your tools and keep your tools clean, and you make sure that they're serviceable and up to date, you're more likely than not the independent <coughs> contractor, right? What you charge is gonna include a rate of return on your tools and your investment in the activity. All right. Does the worker lease space, equipment, or facility, right? How many employees lease their own offices and pay for their own offices to work, right? That, it's not gonna be, that's gonna be the independent contract. That's the investment in the activity. It's the behavioral control. All right. What expenses are incurred by the worker? All right, this is a tougher one than it used to be because most, a lot of professionals ask to be reimbursed for their out-of-pocket expenses. You know, lawyers now, uh, accounting firms, you know, the doctors, oh my God, you look at these EOBs, every pill um, is a different reimbursement code. But the general rule is that independent contractors pay their own expenses employees, the employer pays the expenses, right? You don't, why would a guy take a job if he's got to pay all of the expenses to do in that job, right? That's how, when you're doing Schedule A audits and you look at the 2106s, you see that's where you get to the big area of fraud, right? How many, how many government workers have you seen with huge 2106s, right? 20% of pay, 30% of pay. Right? How does that happen? All right? Other than in the return preparer's fantasy land, how does a, a government worker have to then give up 20 to 30 percent of what he or she makes as an employee business expense for the job? But you know, we've all seen big box chains, right, Sal? Big box chains. It's that's the target. It's a, they they come people, taxpayers come in and say, "This is all I want to pay. Make it work." 
And the 2106 is where the numbers get plumped. But, but back to the SSA, employees are generally reimbursed for their expenses. You go to the policy that the companies have. They reimburse for necessary business expenses incurred on behalf of the employer. It would be probably violate the labor laws to require an employee to take money out of their pocket because then you're not paying them their full wage. <clears throat> So that's how you analyze expenses. How are you paid, right? Hourly or by the job. Uh, you know, if, if, can you make profit on that work, right? When a, when a person is paid a regular salary, whether they're productive or not, they're generally going to be an employee, right? Is somebody going to pay you? Pay you? You're a return preparer. Somebody going to pay pay you for just playing on the internet if you don't get their returns done, right? They're paying you by the job. You're doing the return, you gotta produce. Whereas if you're an employer, the, the obligation of supervision is on the employer. Your job is to make the employee productive. If they're not productive, you gotta fire them, right? That's your ability. So who's got the burden of someone not being productive? If the burden is of non-productivity is on the service provider, that service provider is generally an independent contractor. If the burden of the person being lazy or incompetent or a screw-up or doing drugs or getting arrested that day uh, is, and you still got to pay them, then you're probably the employer. Right. Drawing account, uh, who does the customer pay, right? If, if the, does, do you let the customers make checks payable to your employees? No. No, right? They're made payable to the firm, right? An independent contractor is going to have the checks made payable to him. Uh, a firm is going to have checks made payable to them. So again, if you're looking at a business, follow the money. Where does the money go, right? Who makes the profit on the work? That's going to be a factor on independent contractor versus employee. Does the firm carry workers' comp? Right? That's going to be a big issue in a lot of places, right? If, you're, if you have to carry workers' comp, more likely than not, it's going to be an employee, right? The workers' comp is required for employees. It's not required for independent contractors. So the mere fact that you're getting workers' comp is probably an admission that in 90% of the cases, that the service provider is going to be treated as an employee, right? Who's got the risk of loss, right? You know, do the, if the business isn't doing well, do the employees still get their paycheck? You know, unless you're going out of business. The lawyers, you know, the employees get paid whether or not you're making money, right? Period. If you're an owner, you could lose money. And that's going to be how you, you cast that argument on independent contractor versus employee. Sometimes the commission people will say, well, I'm losing money if they don't pay because I don't get my commission. You know, and that's going to be one of the nuances that you argue on independent contractor versus employee. But you think about what happens if the business fails. Yes? With the workman's comp, I mean, when the insurance agent come in, comes in, they have to pay the workman's certificate that he's going to charge you for the uh, employee, employee as, uh, under your workman's comp Right, and, but you get, there's a premium audit after that, and you've got to make your, your argument that they're independent, they shouldn't be covered by workers' comp. Because once you agree that they are covered by workers' comp, that's going to be an admission that they are an employee, right? So it's one of those factors that is very difficult. And again, this moves a little bit state by state because some states require all employers to carry workers' comp, even if you're a sole, a one-member corporation, right? So in some states, the fact that you have, you incorporate and you employ yourself generates the obligation to purchase workers' comp insurance. Now, having purchased workers' comp insurance is a very good fact for the, if, if the service provider has his own workers' comp, 
that's a good fact to show that the service provider is an independent contractor, right? At the end of the day, what's the whole government policy here? To make sure that everybody's covered by unemployment, to make sure that everybody gets workers' comp, to make sure that everybody gets benefits, right? So the, the fact that the service provider buys his own workers' comp helps you make the argument that they are independent. On the other hand, if because of a business arrangement, the, the insurance company says you've got to insure this person, then you're taking the burden on to do everything consistently. And if the service provider says, no, I'm not going to buy it, then the, it's your problem. You it's America. Pay. We can shop around to somebody else. Somebody else. <laughs> right, and that's the thing, right? Work is comp and all the states, it's a big, yeah. Yes? So, well, I was at IT companies uh, asking people to form escort. Yes. And they're saying, well, I'm going to only do business with you if you're an escort. Okay. Now, one, that, that is a very common request, right? And, but what we said here is the mere formalities. Lawyers sitting in rooms creating documents doesn't change control or not control. It changes the risk of audit. Right? If you create that S Corp, it makes it less likely that you're going to issue a W-2 to that S Corp. In, for many uh, years, you didn't issue 1099s to S Corp. So it was a device to avoid the detection of the 1099s, right? Remember we started this by saying, hey, you know, one of the audit triggers is the 1099s. And my answer was, you know, doing something that not issuing 1099s is a bad thing, right? Requiring the employees to create corporations, you know, it may sound nice and avoid detection originally, right? But when it comes up in a criminal case and you hear that the employer said, you don't have your job, Unless you do this, and if they sent you to the lawyer to set it up, and they may have even paid, did they pay for the S Corp to get created? Then you're, you're basically showing the conspiracy to commit the tax evasion, that it was willful, that you were looking to get around the laws, as opposed to planning to comply with the law. All right? Sometimes creating the corporations, that works. Sometimes it doesn't work. All right, so I'm not going to give you an answer on is it the right thing to do or not the right thing to do, because the right thing to do is fill out the forms and understand what the law requires. And then once you've done that, don't do anything to break the law, right? You can go up to the line in the law, but not over the line. And your job is to know where the line is. <laughs> Benefits, big deal, right? Well, if you're gonna pay a guy when he doesn't work, days off, sick, bonuses, you're gonna pay for his health insurance. You pay for health insurance for any independent contractors? No. All right? Well, we've seen a lot of these independent contractors that do because they say the guy won't do the job unless I cover his health insurance, right? That tells you that the person is probably an employee. The provision of benefits, bonuses, Right? Sick days, vacation days, those are indications of employment status as opposed to independent contractors, right? Independent contractors, it's baked into the price already. We lawyers, you bake that into your hourly rate, how much you need to make money. The return prepares the same thing. On the other hand, employees, employee, that's why they call them employee benefits, right? That's going to be a factor towards being employed. How do you terminate, right? If you can just be fired, come in one day, at will employee, I can fire you for any reason, more likely than not, you're gonna be an employee. If you could quit, more likely than not, you're an employee. On the other hand, if you've got a retainer agreement that says you can only get out if you meet certain things, or you need permission of the court to get out, right? That means you're probably an independent contractor. You have your own separate contract that tells you how the relationship ends. Do you provide, does the service provider provide similar services, right? If all of your income comes from one source for a very long period of time, 
Are you really independent or are you dependent? Right? If you're all of your income, by definition, you're dependent on that one source. Independence means I do it for others. Right? So that's going to be one of the factors. And what DOL looks at it, right? If they look at and all your income for a couple of years comes from the same person, the DOL people, Frank over there, he's, his mind is closed now. He's not thinking anything else. Right? You're done. The rest of the audit, you could be saying anything. He's not listening. He's reading his little book, whatever. We're done at that point. Does, okay, next. Does the agreement prohibit competition with the firm? All right? And you see companies try to make this mistake all the time, right? They hire an independent contract, and they say, but I want you to sign a non-compete. How does that hold up? It doesn't. It doesn't, right? Because if they have to sign a non-compete, it means they're integral to your business. That if they're competing with you, they're independent from you. All right? So non-competes are generally going to be for employees, right? You're bringing them in. They're going to have trade secrets. They're working with you. You have your assets. They're certainly not going to compete with you while they're employed by you. Right? And maybe even some post-employment considerations. So a non-compete is the hallmark of an employee, not an independent contractor. Union members, right? By definition, there's a contract with the union to provide employees. The unions don't provide you independent contractors. They're negotiating for the services, they're negotiating for benefits, they're negotiating for health care. So more likely than not, if you're getting your service provider from a union hall and you're signing a contract with a union, that the union, that the service provider is probably going to be an employee. Advertising, all right? Whose name is on a business card? The, the name of the company? that you work for or the name of the service provider, right? Who pays for advertising? Who pays for the Yellow Pages ad or the internet ad or the website? The independent contractor has his own. The employee is on your website. Remember one of the things I said, go right away. Who's got the website? What are you looking at? The employee is on your website. That means he's yours, right? He's not independent. You're saying, go here. You can get to this person. Um, well, who, who does you deliver the services to? These are all self-explanatory. How does the firm represent the workers to its to the customers, right? When you have the customer, do you say, this is a vice president, this is a guy who works for me, or are you selling the independent contractor, right? If you're, you say it this way, if, if I'm bringing the employee in, and I'm introducing them to the customers, it's because I want them to give work to me. If I'm not going to bring a competitor or an independent contractor around to my customers because, again, that person could then, if he's got an independent business, take the customers, right? So that's going to be part of the nuance. You know, is he integral to your business or is he independent from your business, right? How does the relationship end, right? Is he fired or is the contract completed? Independent contractors are hired to do a job. When that job is done, they go home, right? The case is over. The return is prepared. You go home. On the other hand, when you finish one job and then you say, boss, what am I doing next? You're an employee. Right? All of these forms are signed under penalties of perjury. Right? So that's why you go back, you're going to look at these again, you think about your answers, you talk to your customer, I mean, you talk to your client, and you fill it out. Like I said, many of these answers can be nuanced. They're not black and white. You look at them, you look at the guidelines, you go back over 8741, you go back over the article, and you say, all right, how do I get to yes? Now, and what's going to happen, in most cases, unless it's a confidentiality case, right, the IRS is going to send an SSA to the employer to fill out. And you would be surprised how different the answers are. When you're working for the IRS and you get them, it's like, do they work in the same place? 
right? So, and that, that's just the nature of controversy, right? If the good part of it is, if you get into this controversy and the IRS guy doesn't say, bang, employee, you've done your job, right? Because 95% of the SSAs filed by employees, the IRS agrees, right? So if you can do better than that, then you've really helped move the ball along. All right, now, back to independent contractor employee agreements, right? Some of you draft the agreements, some of you review the agreements that your clients have, and I know the type is small, but things that you should do in the agreements to make it clear that a person it has factors. One, require the contractor to give you invoices, right? The requirement of invoices is contrary to the inference that if they're paid, they're paid hourly, right? The invoices let you argue that they're paid for the service that is provided, that it's more of an independent contractor. Require the contractor to pet the money out of their pocket to pay the travel or business expenses even if you're going to reimburse, right? That they pay them out of their own as opposed to you advancing in the money to travel, right? Three, make it clear that in everything the contractor does, he or she is going to say that they're an independent contractor, that they're prohibited from telling people they are employees or otherwise affiliated with the business, right? Not to put on their website or not to try to sell somebody by misstating their title. Right? Salespeople do that all the time. You know, like, I'm, I'm really the boss in charge, or I have this title, or I'm really a partner, when I'm not. Right? So the contract should make it clear. The intent of the parties is, right? Uh, require that the contractor pay taxes. Right? What's the real problem in a lot of these cases? The independent contractor doesn't pay the taxes. Right? There is, again, one of the IRS studies says that if you forget to send in the guy the 1099, there is an 81% chance that he's going to forget to report the money. And if they don't report the money, you can't get something later that's called the credit, right? Because if the IRS isn't allowed to keep the money twice. So say you paid somebody as an independent contractor, but then they paid self-employment tax. Home run! You net the tax out. The IRS only gets the difference. But what if they don't pay anything at all because you forgot to send them a 1099? Or because they forgot to report the income? You know, the memory is a funny thing. <laughs> no, the, the sending the 1099 is raises compliance from, okay, without a 1099, compliance from self-employed people is about 20%. With the 1099, it's 81%, right? Because people know it's going to the government, they are more afraid of of not reporting. Two, return preparers. I go to my return preparers, I got these 1099s, but we're not reporting. I want to, I only want to pay so much. The only way we're going to get there is you forget about these 1099s, right? That doesn't work. The return preparer says, no, we're going to up the deductions. We're not going to reduce the income. <laughs> That's the difference between a tax professional. <laughs> but, <laughs> next. Require them to file what's called, uh, to give you on request, the form 4669, Statement of Payments Received. Remember, I told you there's something that says that if they pay the tax, you can take a credit against your tax, right? But do most people want to give you your, their full tax return? Your employees, your independent contractors, they want to give you their tax return? No. No. So, but the IRS has a form that if they fill that out, right? Then they could check that the taxes were paid on this money that you paid them, right? You're gonna contractually require that they pay tax. That shouldn't be controversial, 
right? You're only requiring them to do what the law requires. If they won't sign that, we got a problem. And then require them to indemnify and hold you harmless, right? That if they don't pay tax and you don't get the credit, that you have this separate contractual right to sue them. You're not changing the relationship, right? The law, the IRS, the courts, they make the decision as to whether or not you're an independent contractor or employee, right? We go to tax court, a judge makes a decision one way or the other. But if the reason you pay tax is because the guy on the other side of the contract didn't pay his tax, that you're gonna be able to And again, the right to do that, the right to sue them, generally makes people more compliant, right? It's like sending the 1099. It's like saying, you don't do the right thing, I'm gonna sue you. So not only do you have to worry about the IRS, you gotta be worried about Frank coming and suing you. I mean, that's gonna encourage voluntary compliance. It's just good citizenship to require that. All right, so those are things that, yes? Any experience with people actually using the 4699? Yes. Uh, it's, it's a big thing now, and that's in, in the materials and, and the website. We talked about a case called the Mescalario Apache Tribe, where um, it, it, it is the ultimate issue. On the cases where the employees returned the 4669, you know, the case went away. And then the, the other thing, the next issue in the case is, can you get the IRS? to give you that information, right? The IRS, so remember we talked about 6103 before? So in the Mescalario in the Intribe case, the IRS was going after the tribe, saying these people are independent contractors. I mean employees and not independent contractors. The tribe said, these people pay tax on the money. And the IRS said, you know, we can't tell you whether or not they pay tax on the money because of 6103. So, you know, the only solution is for you to pay twice. The court didn't agree. <laughs> the court said, right, the, the employer is only the agent, the withholding agent, he collects the money for the government but had to ensure that, the, because what is withholding? It's a deposit on the correct tax, right? Does the government get to collect more than the correct tax? No. So if the taxpayer already paid the tax, does the government get to keep the deposit? Could they charge you a second deposit? No. So that's why the 4669 is important. And the IRS does respect it, because who's gonna sign a 4669 knowing that the IRS is gonna verify it, right? The, we've had cases where we send the 4669 out and then we see all of the like, late filed returns. Right, because what's the other side of an employee employer case? If it's not criminal, and even sometimes when it is a criminal case, I'm representing the employer. Right? I need to get that credit from the employees paying their tax. Right? I want to bring down the relevant conduct. I want to bring down the tax loss. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go after the employees, and I'm going to say, did you pay your tax? You know, my guy is under criminal investigation, so I need to know that you paid your tax. They then go to a lawyer. They heard, all they heard was criminal investigation. And what do they do? They look at their tax returns, and they say, oh my God, I forgot to dump the 1099. Or, I don't think I got it, but I got the checks. So then they amend their return. They pay the tax. They send us the 4669. All right, and that actually happens quite a bit because if you have a client coming to you and said that the guy who paid you lots of money is under criminal investigation, are you thinking about my client's well-being? No, you're thinking about your well-being. You're saying, Does the, where's the IRS go next? And, oh my God. Is the employer going to try to reduce his jail time by turning me in? Right, that's the currency of the federal government. Right, a cooperator reduces his jail time by turning in other people who didn't comply with the law. So, in employment tax cases, it is a dance. But the 4669 and the 4670 
is really important. And that's why I tell employment lawyers now, make sure you put it in the form, right? If you're going to go to the trouble of doing an independent contractor agreement, and the reason you're doing the independent contractor agreement in most cases is because you want to lock in the tax benefits, then lock in the tax benefits. Complete. Be complete. So, break? Okay, sorry, I gotta give you guys another break. Sorry. <laughs> to say, hey, this, if I'm supposed to put on the, you know, what other courses you want to see. Because if enough people ask for something, then we're gonna make sure that there's a course that covers it, if you're, you're all seeing it, right? So please fill out your evaluations. Um, all right, let me go through. All right, now, what are you going to do? So now you filled out your SSA. You realize my guy that um, got a, um, a 1099 really wants to be a W-2. How do you fix it, All right? Well, step one, you got to pay your half of Social Security, right? You're going to back out your self-employment. You're going to do your 8919, and you're going to do that. You're going to take your... If you got your 1099, you're going to move it to your 4852. You think you should have been a W-2, right? You got a 1099. So what do you need to do? You got to pay your half of Social Security. You're going to see that on your 8919. You got to move your income from your 1099 to a W-2 format. The IRS has a form for that, the 4852, right? And that's how you move yourself from being the 1099 that you got to the W-2 that you want to be. In many cases, you know, only paying half of the Social Security and moving everything to the Schedule A, the kind of almost nets out, right? So you definitely want to look at this process before the statutes of limitations expire and decide that you're going to amend the return, you're going to be an employee, right? And that labor lawyers are going to tell you that if you can do any kind of litigation that you want your overtime, you want your minimum wage, you want to be in the pension plan that you didn't think you should have gotten, you want to be, uh, you want your health insurance reimbursed, right? In many companies, the employees get health insurance. The independent contractors don't. If you're misclassified, you're going to want your health insurance. You're going to want your pension plan. And there is a statute. I'm not going to, it's in the materials. I don't think you're going to have time to cover it. That you can actually sue your employer. You don't have to wait for the IRS to do it. It's 7434. You can sue the employer. And whereas the IRS can only get back three years, you can go back six years and get six years of benefits, right? And once you get yourself into the pension plan and you're in a defined benefit plan, right, you get a court order that says you should have been an employee and you should have been covered by that benefit plan, then you're in that benefit plan. And then you're talking about big dollars. And this, so there's a damage claim. And if the employer was wrong, right, and you show that it was clear case, it was essentially that it was fraud to send you a 1099 instead of a W-2. What else is the employer going to have to pay? The employee's legal fees, right? So that's why contingent fee lawyers are very dangerous. Right? They encourage tax compliance. Lawyers are good for tax compliance. You know, after the IRS, we do our job. Uh, <laughs> all right, so again, this is how you, you, you do it. You're 8919. And then um, the IRS will, you can go to tax court, and that's all right. Now, during the exam process, right, the 4669, right, at the end of the day, you get all the 4669s, the, the IRS has a form of 4670, and that's going to be your credit for the tax, right, because the IRS doesn't collect the tax twice, all right? What the, I've given you in the materials is a copy of the 4669. It's a very simple form, right? It, it is a very simple form for two things. One, you know, you're going to get your credit. Two, it's going to scare the crap out of the person if he didn't report. Because you're being asking them to say what you did report, what did you pay. So they're going to amend their return and they're going to pay and you're going to get your credit anyway. 
right? 4670 is just your total up, your number of your 4660s, all right? Uh, Mescalero tribe, right? Why do you do this and why do you now have the ability to do a FOIA if the employee doesn't want to give you the information? Under Mescalero tribe, you might be able to get the IRS to tell you under the Freedom of Information Act whether or not the employee paid the tax, right? Because um, in, in Mescalero, it said that 6103 doesn't apply if whether or not the employee paid the tax affects your tax, right? Because the IRS shouldn't get the money twice. And that's because of the statute that says if the employer doesn't withhold, but then the tax is paid, the government doesn't get it twice. The government can still hit you with the penalties, right? For not filing the forms and doing that, but they don't get to collect the tax twice. So if you're the employer, and you can convince the employee to make it right, pay what he should have paid, right? Because you treated him as an independent contractor, he was supposed to pay self-employment tax. If he in fact paid his tax, there's a lot less money that you gotta pay the code gives you that credit, right? So, and, and that's the part of it that a lot of professionals fall down on, right? You get Frank over there, he comes in, he does your independent contractor audit, they want to hit you with the employment tax, and people forget, hey, but I can go get part of that money back as a credit. I don't have to pay the whole thing, right? Now you guys know that whether it's under the Freedom of Information Act, or you go to the employee directly, you can figure out how not to have to have the entire burden by yourself. <clears throat> so what happens, these cases, when the SSHs go to the IRS, there's a technician, they look at it, um, the determination, if the IRS rules one way or the other, it's binding on the IRS. It's not binding on you, because you have the right to go to court. Right? It was, if you're the employer, 7436, Tax Court Rule 290, they, the notice of determination is your ticket to the tax court. It gives you the right for a redetermination of the, the, the IRS's determination. Is that more discretion? They have, well, they're going to apply the law. The IRS is going to apply the law zealously, but in favor of their position. Right? The, what the tax court does is it redetermines, it looks at it de novo, and they may listen to the witnesses, and they may evaluate the credibility of the witnesses differently than the IRS did, right? They may see the law differently. Uh, so, and, and that's what happens. If you look at these cases, the way they're coming out, they don't all come out in favor of the IRS, right? They go in all directions. There's nothing like a live trial with people who are under oath to really get to the truth, right? Lawyers on both sides, whether you're the tax, uh, the, the lawyer for the government or the lawyer for the taxpayer, you know, there's, there's a competition that goes from this, right? Both sides want to win, and that's the adversary system. Both sides present their best case, and it's the job of the court to listen and say, all right, what is the right result under the tax law? And that's the greatest thing about our system, right? That every taxpayer has the right to challenge the government's determination and get an independent court to review it and make the decision, right? So from the, from the employer's part, you're gonna get a notice of determination, you're gonna file with the tax court. From the employee's part, you're gonna get a notice of deficiency. And again, you're gonna challenge the, um, the information report, the W-2 or the 1099 that's filed by the firm, and you're gonna get to litigate what you believe the correct treatment on your tax return should be, employee or independent contractor, and then all of the deductions that flow from that. At what what do they look at? Sometimes you're going to look at one year, right? The employee is going to file for the year that they're they're unemployed. But what, what's the IRS going to do? They're going to look at multiple years, right? 
In a lot of cases, what are they finding out? For some big companies, people are W2, 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 then the company had you know, an economic problem, <coughs> then they fire everybody but brought them back as 1099s. And they're doing the same job. And they got the same email address. Did they really change from employees to independent contractors? Right? So you, they, they're going to look at the whole service, right? That's why one of the things and the mistakes I see people making is have the same guy be a W-2 and a 1099 in the same year. <laughs> right? Partial W-2, partial 1099. Right? How's that? Come on. All right? You're either an employee or an independent contractor. There's no hybrid. You can't say, oh, I'm just going to take the commissions. Yes? What is the employee slash independent contractor doing that I'm that's why we have the 4852. You analyze it and you file a true and correct return. What other answer am I going to give you? File a true and correct return. Uh, you, you look at it, you analyze it, you do what we just did. You look at the SSA form and you come up with your answer. And you, to the extent you need to challenge it, you need to challenge it. The one thing that I find you funny about this is you would think that these are going to be 100% audits, right? I'm going to take a position different. I got W-2s. And I'm going to take a position that they're 1099s. And I'm going to file a Schedule C. And I'm going to file a little disclosure statement that explains why I'm filing a return sync consistent with the W-2. And you would think I'm going to get a 100% order rate on that. No. I've got a lot of these where they buy it. They just, somebody reads it and somebody says it's not enough money. And they buy it. I, I'm not going to say it doesn't. I'm going to say it doesn't. It's not a hundred percent trigger of an audit, right? A lot of well, 4852s don't trigger a lot of audits. I mean, just think about how many of them have to be filed a year, right? A lot of undocumented workers work on rented Social Security numbers, right? But when they file their returns, they file with their ITINs. Um, not all of, uh, I mean, a really small percentage of those I've seen go to audit. Um, look, I've got cases where employee, you know, undocumented workers have had to file returns in order to get cancellation or removal, right? And you would think, oh my God, you know, now they're going to go after the employer, right, for hiring all these people off the books. That doesn't happen 100% of the time, right? There's a set group that does these audits, like you make a voluntary disclosure, right? For somebody who's been undocumented, they need to clean stuff up, you go through the voluntary disclosure program. You think that they're 100% of those cases that the IRS then expends the resources and goes after the employer? Doesn't happen, all right? Everybody, the IRS is working in a challenged environment. They pick and choose their spots and which cases they work on. So all you can be concerned with is that you get your client to compliance and you minimize the risk to your client. And to the extent that you think it's really good information, you push the reward application. But, um, and if many of you get any inf any experience with the reward program, a lot of two one ones get filed. Not every one of the two one ones gets acted upon. The IRS just doesn't have the resources. I mean, in terms of CI, there are probably 50% of the agents that they had 10 years ago. I mean, the, the number of special agents has gone down quite a bit. The IRS workforce has gone down quite a bit with all of the budget cuts, right? So the, there is nothing that you could say today is going to be a 100% audit issue, right? Because they're working in a resource-challenged environment, and they've got to make you know, what we would call business decisions as to the allocation of their resources. Okay, where, again, where you file it, the SSA doesn't toll the statute of limitation. Good thing and bad thing, right? For the employer, you want these SSA audits to take forever, because more and more, you know, the three-year statute of limitations is going to go, right? There is a, for the IRS, there is a three-year statute of limitations. If the tax returns are filed, on time, right? The issue is generally not a fraud issue. Independent contract is a factual issue, is a three-year statute. For the employee suing in district court, it's a six-year statute. 
but it's a three-year statute. So there is an elegance of delay in these cases, right? Because the more years that go, the, the less you end up having to pay. All right? Now, 3509, then we're going to talk about CSP. If you are audited, right, there are programs where you don't, there's a reduced rate that you pay to settle and then be good going forward. And that's, you should familiarize yourself with Section 3509, right? It's a reduced rate of withholding, right? Because, and you then just pay all FICA, right? Again, let's think about what you're doing when you have an employee. With an employee, you should withhold both ends of Social Security, and you should withhold withholding. In many of these cases, the taxpayer is already paying tax on what should have been withheld. So the IRS, again, in, in an effort not to double bang you, is just going to charge you for the Social Security. Right? So that's what 3509 gives you a break on. Now, what do you need to have 3509 work for you? Well, you have to file the 1099s. Again, remember we said at the beginning, not filing 1099s is a bad thing. Setting up corporations to avoid the filing of 1099s is a bad thing because you've now increased your risk if you do get audited versus decreased your risk because of the availability of 3509 relief. So if you file the 1099s, then instead of withholding of what the employee's rate would have been, right? you know, 15%, 20%, whatever the withholding rate would have been for that income level, you get to, your withholding is 1.5%. So you pay Social Security and just 1.5%, right? So that's a real benefit. Freddie, against some of the tax and the Social Security that was paid by the employee as self-employment tax, right? If you didn't file the 1099s, you're going to pay 3%. Still, not the worst in the world. Unless the failure to file was, you know, uh, well, I was going to say, unless it's willful, right? It's going to be intentional disregard of the requirement to deduct and withhold. Then you can't get the benefit of 3509, right? So you have to demonstrate reasonable cause. You know, what's reasonable cause? That you, you thought that that you didn't need to treat this person as an employee, right? There's another relief program, right? The other thing that's really nice is if you fix it, they don't charge you interest on the employment tax, right? 6205, you, one of the unique areas of code, taxpayers are eligible for interest-free adjustments. All right. That's why the strategy in a lot of these cases, right, you come in, they're looking at some of these issues. Are they going to disallow deductions? Or are they going to make it employment tax? So you always keep in mind the 6205 interest-free deductions as to where you settle issues like, you know, was the reimbursement of additional of expenses really additional income as opposed to a deductible expense? You're going to move it to the employment tax return, pay it tax-free as opposed to putting it on the income tax return and disallowing the deduction, right? So, I mean, there is a strategy and running numbers a couple of different ways when you understand that there is the interest-free adjustment of 6205, right? So always keep that in mind. Again, so that this is the, the, uh, going through the, the procedures and how it works. You know, you, you, they find it. You pay the tax, the interest-free deduction, there's a form of 2504, and then you could still, uh, as long as you get pay the tax before there's a notice in demand, there is no interest, right? What does a notice in demand do in an employment tax case? It starts the running of interest. It's like your trust fund recovery penalty. Employment taxes, until the IRS sends a notice in demand for payment, the interest doesn't start running. So what your job is to do is to pay that tax before the notice in demand is sent. That's why in trust fund recovery penalties, they have a notice that the interest doesn't start running until they assess the tax and they send the notice in demand, right? That's when interest starts running in employment tax cases. And one of the things to always remember when you have a trust fund recovery penalty cases to make sure and verify that the IRS sent the notice in demand to the last known address because if they sent it to the employer's address instead of to 
the taxpayer's you know, address, his last known address, interest doesn't start running on the 6303A, and that's one of the ways you can settle a case with appeals. So then the, the IRS only has jurisdiction from the employee's appeal. The workers, of, and that's the, from the notice of determination, the employee has to wait for the notice of deficiency. So employer, notice of determination, rule 290, employee, notice of determination, regular deficiency procedures, all right? How do you protest? Again, you have the right to go to appeals. Before you get your notice of determination, you're going to get your 30-day letter. You have the right to go to appeals. It's the normal appeals process. Uh, you go through, and again, you write your letters. What happens? The, the IRS examiner gets the opportunity to write a rebuttal letter to the appeals officer, and then it's a normal appeals. If you don't appeal, you're going to get your notice of determination, and that's your ticket to the tax court. Um, all right, that's just procedures. That, now, what else can you do? There are settlement programs, CSP and 530. I want to talk about 530 first. Um, let's go before that. Let's go to 530. 530. 530. All right. One of the greatest escape valves, and what the tax court, and you can always argue in appeals, is Section 530 relief. Section 530 relief basically says, I got it wrong, but it was a close call. So what IRS, what I want to do is, let's forget the past. Well, why do we want to dwell on the past? Let's talk about the future. I'm going to correct it going forward. Let's be, I'm going to be employees going forward. But maybe the past should be forgiven. Because really, what do you want? You want voluntary compliance. You want us to do the right thing going forward. You really want to punish mistakes in the past that could have gone either way. I don't want to litigate this. So then there's Section 530 relief. A Section 530 relief. As long as you can show that you were reasonable, that there, you were consistent, and you filed all the right information requirements, right? You didn't hide anything from the IRS. You can get Section 530 relief from the additional employment tax adjustments, right? So reasonable basis, right? What's a reasonable basis? You know, I looked it up. I looked at all these rulings. There's lots of inconsistency. Hey, you can't punish me for reading the rulings the wrong way, right? The IRS, you do that every day. Courts are reverse you all the time. So just making a mistake doesn't mean that I was unreasonable, right? Because law is an art, it's not a science. Um, one of the things, one of the greatest defenses of reasonableness is, hey, I was audited before by the IRS and the other IRS agent didn't read this decision. Get me into a false sense of security, IRS. I relied on you. Your guy was wrong and now I gotta be punished? Is he still working for you? Is he get, drawing a, if he's not, is he drawing a pension? Right, and so I'm the only one who's gonna be punished. That can't work. They don't go against oh, their pension, have they? No, I'm not asking them to go against their pension. I'm asking no, them to say, this guy was the smartest guy you ever had. He retired now, and now you got this idiot who wants to, to cause me to pay tax? I'll do it, because I don't want to fight with you. But don't, just go forward. Not the pension. No, we never heard anybody collect a pension. Christy did. <laughs> Ooh, I hear a disgruntled state employee. <laughs> okay, so All right, reasonable basis. The courts construe that liberally in favor of the taxpayer. Okay, substantive consistency. That we're treating them all the same, right? You're not saying we're picking and choosing. I'm giving the guys I like. W-2s and health insurance, but the guys I don't like, they get no benefits. Or I'm going to treat all the men one way and the women on another way. No. Yes. You, yes. Oh, we can do that? <laughs> as long as we benefit. You can't do that. Right? Substantive consistency. Everybody, you know, similarly situated people are treated the same. Yes. All right? 
you know, and, and how do you do it, right? Because then, you know, or what is similar? You know, you look at the jobs. And if essentially they're doing the same job, they should be treated the same way. Right? Not that you gotta pay them the same. The IRS doesn't do that. They just look that you treat them for independent contractor versus employee the same way. All right? And then reporting consistency. That if you said they were independent contractors, you actually sent the 1099s. Right? Because not, and remember I said it before, not sending the form is always going to be a bad thing. Telling them to incorporate, to avoid not sending the form is going to be a bad thing. Because you're going to get, in many cases, you can get out of the tax by asking for Section 530 relief. So what do we got? We got, we got 3509, a reduced rate. We got 530, we agree to fix it going forward. We got the credit for the employees that paid. You got the 3549s. I mean, the, the, so I mean, you, you got to read all of the procedures because there is a lot that you could do in these cases to help your taxpayers. All is not lost when somebody comes in and say they want to make a reclassification of a service provider. All right, and then uh, the, the burden is on the employer to prove that you actually sent the 1099s. You know, a lot of people say, you know, I sent them, the IRS lost them. 500 of them? <laughs> you know, don't you remember the pictures of the Philadelphia Service Center and the employees throwing the boxes? you know, away because they couldn't process the stuff in time. My client's stuff were in those boxes. It's only my, that was the Agostino dumpster. <laughs> it was. They picked out all the mail from the office and that's what they shredded. Alright. Now, medical emergency care. Late 1099s. They could still avoid the 530 relief, right? There's the voluntary disclosure program, right? What happens in a voluntary disclosure program? You file some returns. They may be late, but they're filed. Maybe you have a penalty, but they're filed. So, but now that filing may help you with your Section 530 relief. So remember I said the beginning of this process, at the end of that SSA review, you got things to think about. These are the things to think about. Am I going to file that late 1099? And you're going to fight with the client, right? They're going to, I'm not doing that. That's a penalty. I'm not doing that. But you got to, sometimes you got to think of the big picture. That's why they pay you the big bucks, to think about the strategy of how this thing is going to play out till the end. And here's your problem. Going forward, well, one, 530 relief doesn't help you with Obamacare. Right? They're considered, they're still considered employees, but you're just being excused from the old employment tax. But you got to cover the Obamacare taxes. All right? So that's, that was just, that's, the IRS came out with that before the new executive order. So I don't know what's going to happen in light of the executive order, but this is where we are today. All right? And there are certain employees that have been excluded from 530 relief because there is such an abuse area and your engineers and your IT guys, right? That's an abuse area. Congress has said they don't get the benefit of Section 530 because everybody knows those IT guys should be employees. So telling them to file the S-Corp return, Congress already said bad, bad boys. Well, What's the strategy? In, uh Trying to pay engineers and technical guys is, is 1099. I mean, it's lots of money. <laughs> I was a 1099. But they, look, they don't want to pay workers comp. They don't want to pay unemployment. That that's the strategy. It, these are high paid guys, and the benefits are are high on those guys. It's like your sub S guys, right? They tell them they got to file. They got to create corporations now because we don't want to get caught. We don't want to get audited. And it's a big thing. And it is a big thing in certain ethnic communities of let's get everybody on sub S. And think about this. They're not saying just make a corporation, be a C corp, right? They're telling them sub S, so no employment get taxes get paid by anybody. Yep. Right? They're actually interfering with the payment of employment taxes on purpose. Yep.
All right. Volunt now, finally, there's a voluntary classification program. So, I mean, the IRS, really, what is the message from all these programs? 3509, CSP, 530, uh, now the voluntary classification settlement program, which is the version of the voluntary disclosure program for this. Correct it going forward, and the past, and most of the past, will be forgiven, right? Because what does the government want? They want voluntary compliance and self-assessment every year. Reclassifying is an annuity for the IRS, right? Because now you got people on payroll who are going to be paying tax every year. The, the amount of dollars is going up. You know, sending the information report, withholding from the source is what, in, what increases tax compliance, right? Now, mostly you just went through filing season. What percentage of the clients got refunded? Right? A very high percentage of the returns that you file were filed not to pay money in, but to get money back, because withholding was already done, right? That's the way our system works. That and when, when withholding went in, voluntary compliance went up. If you don't withhold at the source, then voluntary compliance goes down because people spend the money to do other things. They have other uses for the money. So these programs right now are all very, very generous. You know, we're gonna, if, as long as you play by the rules and you just weren't like violating rules, violating, not sending 1099s, being frivolous, uh, paying them in cash off the book so you didn't even report the gross receipts and you went to a check cash. I can all give that to a CID agent once. Like, how can I get, just give me this. I'll be good going forward. Let's forget the crimes of the past. CI, yeah, not so warm and cuddly when it comes to forgiveness. But the, every other part of the service, right, they want you to voluntarily comply going forward. All right. And that's what a lot of these programs are. Again, the, what does the, the voluntary uh, compliance settlement program require? Consistent treatment. Issue the 1099s. Also, there can't be a trigger event. You can't come and say, I want to be good going forward if you're already being audited by IRS, DOL, or another state, right? Because the, the states and the IRS have these treaties and memorandums of understanding where if the state reclassifies you, they're supposed to send the notification to the IRS for them to reclassify. So going in now, that's not voluntary. That's like, I know what's going forward. I mean, the, there there is, if you want to talk about Big Brother, right? They're talking about like exchange, information exchanges to show the 941s, workers' comp, and the state filings for some kind of consistency. Because, and it, I, it's hard to believe until you start seeing it, there are taxpayers and return preparers that, you know, for one return, they were independent contractors. For other returns, they were employees, right? You know, especially in construction, they need to put them on prevailing wage, right? But they don't, so they need to put them on prevailing wage to get paid from the, the government, but they really don't want to pay those payroll taxes. So for some purposes, they're W-2s. Prevailing wage, they're employees. For other purposes, especially for workers' comp, workers' comp is expensive. And they were really independent. <laughs> so the, the, the move is to get to substantive consistency throughout. That's why this is a trigger. Right? And the IRS has formed to go into the 8952 uh, the, to get you into the voluntary compliance program. And again, they're very welcoming. They help you get through this process. If you're willing to correct going forward, the IRS is going to work with you. Problem with it is some businesses can't afford to treat everybody as employees, right? Because then the business model falls apart. So it's not the answer if you're wrong. I mean, if you really think they're independent contractors. The answer if you really believe they're independent contractors, take the notice work with uh, determination and go to tax court and fight it. And you're gonna get a fair shake. Uh, and this is the copy of the form. There's also in the materials. Um, Again, the, the, the mere fact that the IRS gives you the amnesty and says they're not going to go backwards doesn't mean anything for the states. 
right? You're still subject to audit by the states. But I haven't seen a lot of audits. So it's not like the IRS is calling and saying, hey, you went into the voluntary compliance program for the state of New Jersey. Now New Jersey want to go audit. I haven't seen that. Most of the time, you go into the voluntary compliance program and correct it going forward. You're good. You go with God. You haven't seen other state audits. Okay, I'm out of time. All right, they say I'm out of time. There's more stuff in the materials. We've covered most of it. Then the next month is going to be penalties, civil and criminal penalties. And I guess we'll start with the trust fund recovery penalty. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for listening. Do we need to your, uh, your forms? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fill out your evaluations and come to the barbecue. You'll see the materials in the flyer. June 14th this year is, is the Agostino and Associates barbecue. And if you haven't been there before, you really want to come. It's the first time, and then we have uh, Mr. Carp and Cecil. Cecil's not here. They passed this time. I think we had uh, you know, four people, which is 25% of people in the country, that have passed the exam for this place. So you've got to, I mean, you're all, you should all be proud of yourself, right? And now we're going to be trying cases. These, these uh, now United States Tax Court practitioners are there. They're going to be trying cases, and as Judge Vasquez says, he's going to treat them no different than anyone who graduated from Harvard Law School that appears before the court. So uh, you guys are doing great work. Uh, the volunteers who, who pass the exam, the volunteers who haven't, the people who come and assist. I mean, if you, you don't get to talk to the judge as much, but New York is very different than any place else in the United States because if there is a meritorious tax case from someone who has no money, right, uh, we can find volunteers to help them. And they, we, you guys have done a great job, right? It changes the complexion of the case, right? That no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter how limited your language skills, there are people that have stepped up to the plate, volunteered, and helped them understand their tax case, translated uh, tax law to make it easy for them to understand, negotiated settlements for them, got them justice, uh, offers and compromise, uh, employment agreements, and the whole bit. The next thing that we're going to be uh, doing for TAC, right, with the Diane, um, where's Gessa, uh, Karen, Cecil, we're going to become a, a certified acceptance agent to help um, people get ITs, right, so that you don't have to send your documents out in the mail. So we've got a lot of exciting things in the works uh, so that you know, th this class will really be very well known in the tax controversy community in New York and nationwide. I mean, there are, that's why you know, I joke about the online. And we've got volunteers now and people uh, throughout the United States and now even outside the United States. So uh, you really should be proud of yourselves for everything you guys have accomplished. Okay. Um, with that, we can go on soon. Oh, sorry. Hi, home audience. Uh, all right. Tonight's topic, we're going to start with employment tax controversies. You're seeing it more and more. Right? If you look at the tax court cases, there are people getting W-2s who want to say they're independent contractors. There's people getting 1099s who are saying, no, I should really be an employee. There is the New Jersey Department of Labor that's out there. Where is Mr. Pisano? You know, he just retired, so he's now coming over from the dark side. But he was all there. Every, he had one answer. Employee. But, you know, they're an independent contractor. No, they're an employee. <laughs> there, there are the IRS audits, there are reward applications, the IRS is taking reward applications now. You know, for people who are misclassifying, you think you should be getting a W-2 and not a 1099. So what I want to try to do tonight is go over what you need to know, but I'm going to go over it in a way that's a little different. I'm going to actually go over it by filling out the IRS form. And, and go, what you should be thinking about 
when we go over the, the two forms I'm going to try to do tonight are the SSA, right? How many of you have worked with the SSA before, right? Okay, so we're going to go through, you know, the questions on the SSA. What are you thinking about? How does that impact whether you're an independent contractor or employee? And then the, the other form we're going to go over is the, the 4180. It's the review of the responsible person. Because more and more, what happens? You know, you've misclassified employees, so that's going to bankrupt the company. And then the IRS has to go through the responsible persons to pick up the unpaid payroll taxes. So the forms that we're going to try to go through are that. There's lots of great materials. I don't know. We had some technical difficulties emailing out to the group today because of the size. If you didn't get the email with the materials, please email me uh, because there, there's lots of good materials, uh, the slides, and uh, all right. So let's start on the materials. Excuse me, is, right. that in, is it going to be on the Google Drive? Yeah, we'll put it on the Google Drive as well. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. For those of you who are on the Google group, and uh, we're going to put it on that. And then, too, if you're not on the Google group, you really should try to sign yourself up for the group because all of the, the seminars that we do are posted on there. I'm still posting the important cases that you should all know as stuff comes out so you, you follow up on the current events. And we're going to start posting now the, the questions and answers for the 2016 exam that just that was just given, as well as more study materials, so that those of you who didn't pass this time you know, are going to pass 2018. Yes, yes, Laura. Can you put the 2016 exam up so we can find? It is 2016 it is? exam. I didn't post your answers yet, no, did but you post the, exam? I the, the the 20 I did the as soon as we got the exam, it got posted. Because oh, I only had the um, uh, the tax set. Now, they, uh, I'll post it again, and Eva's working on the answers. What I asked everyone to do is to send me their exams, and then I've taken, what we're gonna do is post every question, and then every answer that got full points, so that anyone who took the exam can compare what was the best answer, a full point answer, to their own. And for people who are close, right, we have 60 days for a review, Anyone who's failed by just a couple of points, and then you look at the questions that got a full point answer, you know, we'll help you with the, the appeal process within the 60 days. Because there are a couple of you I know passed all three parts and are just a little short, right? And if you are, let's see if we can get you the rest of the way, okay? Uh, don't give up. Do not be discouraged if you didn't pass the first time. All right, just getting through it is good. And I was going to say the story, the young people, there were, there were some young people who take the exam, right? And very, very young. And every one of the kids who took the exam, you know, eventually got into like an Ivy League school. So they, it, it, the, the, the class can go from very young to very old, practicing before the tax right? If you haven't come and, and watched the session yet, just come. They are a lot of fun, right? Even if you're not trying a case, you're watching other people try the case. Watching the case. Like, we had a, and then I have to get to the materials, we had a great case the other week, right? What was the fact pattern? Clients had a Schedule C, all right? And their Schedule C deducted their travel to and from Broadway plays. Their, and the cost of the tickets, you know, included was Hamilton. They deducted going to Hamilton, right? And what was their business? They wanted to be playwrights and songwriters. <laughs> so their Schedule C was about being playwrights and songwriters. And the songs that they had written and the plays that they were in, they didn't get a lot published. They haven't had their big breakthrough hit yet. But they were earnest enough that the volunteers got them, you know, a substantial amount of the deductions on their Schedule C. So, I mean, again, the cases are what are the real life cases, things that happen when you're when the people come into your office 
to do tax returns, right? Somebody says, gets a, a 1099, says, no, I should have been a W-2. You know, I shouldn't have to pay all of this self-employment tax. You know, so it's the questions that you ask yourself, and you say, I can't sign that return. Maybe you can sign that return. Or you get to see the ones who said, uh, my favorite, you know, people who take, well, I'm not going to go through the bad ones, but you watch the people that you would, you would say, I'm, thank God I'm not like that guy. And then you see the ones where, how far you can push. I, I really recommend that everybody come. All right, let's talk about why, what is this independent contractor employee issue? Why is the IRS coming in and, and, and interfering with the, the freedom of contract, right? Um, they did a survey, 59% of the people that are uh, classified as 1099s, they like being classified as 1099s. They think the IRS is butting in when they come in to reclassify them, right? They're happy taking their deductions on their Schedule C. Now, they don't want to be limited to that Schedule A. <laughs> you know, so, let's go. So, why, why do they do it, right? Because, I mean, what, what's an employer supposed to do? He files the 940s, the 941s, you withhold wages, you, you, you make sure that that's done. Right? What are the, the employment taxes? You know, we, we all know it. You're going to have your withholding at the source. You're going to have your Social Security. You're gonna, then you're going to file your 940s for your unemployment. So there's lots of taxes that get paid from self-employment. All right? You know, we've got the dates. It's more like the economy. They won't destroy the uh, under, underground economy. Well, yeah, that's a good point, right? Well, the, one of the stats is that you know, when there is an information report, when there is withholding at the source, the IRS's collection of the tax <coughs> is much, much higher than if they have to pursue the 1099. So that is one of the factors, but it's not, right? We all know that there are add-ons, right? Once you have an employee-employee relationship, you got workers' comp, you have unemployment benefits, right? You have other things. The ACA could apply. So there are other benefits that Congress said employers should provide employees, right? And those add-ons can be significant. So many employers want to classify as many workers as they can as 1099s to avoid it, right? And most employees are okay with it until something goes wrong, right? And what are the things that go wrong, right? You get hurt, you lose your job, you don't get insurance, you're not in the pension plan. So there are many things that go with the employment relationship, all right? So you've got, what does the employer got to do? You've got to make your, your, you withhold from people's paychecks and you've got to make those deposits with the IRS. Um, and so, and we know there are penalties for not depositing, right? So once the IRS goes into the, hey, your person was an employee as opposed to an independent contractor, then you've got to start thinking about, oh my God, this failure to deposit penalties. I should have been withholding the whole time. Right? And the penalties are big. 1%, 5%, 10%, right? The, 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 it's not just like your income tax estimated tax penalties. These failure to deposit penalties can be very high. All right? Then there's, in addition, you got your failure to pay penalties, right? And then you got your if you've treated everybody as independent contractors as opposed to employees, you could also have your failure to file penalties, right? The failure to file penalty could be up to 25%. So, you know, the government says it's a lot of money, right? And you read lots of statistics, it's billions of dollars every year that doesn't get reported, um, you know, and just an example in the red, how much can it cost, right? You got a corporation, has $200,000 in employment tax liability. What can you get hit for? You can get hit for $50,000, your late filing penalties. You get hit for your failure to pay penalties. You get hit for your failure to deposit penalties. And then interest can run on top of that. I mean, so on a $200,000 tax liability, 
you can be paid $136,000 in penalties. Like I said, I had an organized crime client once. <laughs> once. Once? Once? A few years ago. Right, and I had to explain the, IR, the way the IRS computes interest and penalties. Now, this organized crime claimant, he looks at me, you know, because he'd be accused of loan shocking a couple of times. And he says, Frank, didn't they try to put me in jail for less than this? <laughs> when this conviction, when this prosecution is over, we got to figure out how we're going to go into the government business. <laughs> <laughs> So, right? I mean, it's a lot, but it's meant to be a lot. It's meant to be draconian and onerous. And then when we go through the trust fund recovery penalty, it's meant to pierce the veil, right? So that the, whoever is the responsible person knows that even if you bankrupt the company, those payroll taxes, the government is gonna get them, right? Because it's the lifeblood. Right, I think the 2016 year, I don't have the, 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 in the filing season, so it was for 15. Government collected $3.5 trillion, right? Like 720 million of it, 720 million was billion, was, uh, you know, Social Security withholding. Uh, another million, billion and a half was just straight withholding from paychecks, right? I mean, the system, most of the taxes in this country are collected from voluntary compliance, right? From the withholding of checks, of, I mean, from employees' paychecks. The, the, the system grinds to a halt, would grind to a halt if that broke down, right? And it is breaking down because in these economies, when things are tough, right now the, the unpaid tax gap, the, 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 just the number from filing of returns to what's not sent in, what you're giving credit for on the W-2s versus what the government's receiving, they're off between 59 and $61 billion, all right, per year. So, I mean, it's a lot of money, and that's why you're seeing so much emphasis on this, so much emphasis on the early alerts, and everything that the government is doing to make us all understand the importance of the independent contractor employee distinction and the importance of paying payroll taxes on a timely basis. Okay. So, right, so what are they doing? The EFT early alerts, right? They, they know that if they wait too long to get to the field, that's a problem, right? If you get there in the first quarter, then you can work out a payment plan. If you get there after the fifth quarter, how's the person supposed to dig out? So they're trying to get to you earlier uh, and address these issues. They also are running into the identity theft thing. They're also going to be starting to use the uh, private contractors. Pioneer View dealt with for the, the state has now gotten one of the four contracts to collect for the feds. So you're going to be seeing a lot more activity um, in this area. All right, so now let's talk about misclassification. We talked about the numbers. Yeah, those are going to be in the slides. It's a lot of money. The, it's, it's like a 40% add on. Right? How, how many people are misclassified? The Department of Labor has said that you know, when they do their audits, between 10 and 30% of the workers are misclassified. So that's a lot of money that the government is, is losing. Um, in Ohio, they said that, that, that the number was going up, right? That the number of cases of misclassification is going up. Um, and then the final statistic, when an employee files an SSA, 95% of the time, the IRS says, what? Yeah, well, now it's not always an audit, but 95% of the time when they decide, the IRS agrees with the employee that, I mean, the worker that should have been classified as an employee as opposed to an independent contractor. So the numbers are out there. All right. Again, 
New York, the problem is, is big, right? New York said that they thought they had 700,000 misclassified employees. Uh, and th th that became even more important because of the Affordable Care Act, right? The need to cover everybody. Um, so what are the, the classifications? Very quickly, um, you know, uh, who's an employee and who's an independent contractor? We're going to go through the 20-part test, and we're going to go through the three-part test. But at the end of the day, the first rule is if under common law they would have been considered an employee, they're an employee. Now, what's common law, right? If you have the right to control the person who does the services. An independent contractor is like a lawyer, like many of you, return prepares, right? You, you take on many clients. Your services are open to the public. You provide a service for a firm, but you provide the service to many others. Your business is your own business. You are independent from the business of the employer, right? And in many cases, you know that answer without going through the 20 part test. Common sense tells you that you're in control of the services that are provided by the worker. And that control, that right to say when, how, for whom, is the hallmark of what makes you an employee as opposed to an independent contractor, right? The independent contractor has entrepreneurial risk and the ability to get a profit, right? So in, in many of these cases, before we go through how do you factor this factor and that factor, you're just gonna apply common sense. You know it when you see it, all right? So and that's really what we Remember said. Remember FedEx case? The FedEx case, the, which FedEx case? There's lots of FedEx cases going through the country. Yes. Ground. Yeah, FedEx ground. Yeah, again, there's appeals. That's going all through the ground. You're probably talking about the California case, which is a couple of billion dollars, right? That's, that's a tough case, right? Because what did FedEx do? FedEx had them buy the trucks. They took a mortgage for the trucks, right? They, they theoretically bought their roots. On the other hand, what did the truck say? Did they say Joe's package delivery service on it? It said FedEx. Who got the money? FedEx. Who said what shirts you're going to wear? FedEx. FedEx. Who's told you when you're going to get maintenance on your truck? FedEx. Right? So those are tough cases, right? What did the Court of Appeals say in that case? The lawyers were great. They documented everything. But that's what lawyers do. They live in a fake world. And if you look in the real world, get away from the paper, but look at what the guys did each and every day. Was there any doubt in your mind that these guys worked for FedEx? That they did exactly what the FedEx commercials told you they would do? That they were an integral part of FedEx's business? Could FedEx do the business without them? Right? So, and there are cases going all over the bunch, right? Now there's litigation on Uber and Lyft and all these services. Are these, these drivers workers or not? Is the app the thing that gives you the control? Right, that, every state is litigating that out. And, yes? What do you mean the actual control, just the direct? You don't have to exercise the control. It's the fact that you can exercise the control. You've got employees, are you on top of them every minute of every day? But is there any a doubt that if you told them to do something, they would say how high? I mean, that's gonna be, it's not, and we're gonna go through the factors, but it's not whether you exercise the control. It's whether you have the ability to exercise the control. Again, there's a lot of common sense. We're going to go through it, and like the, the, the judges said in FedEx, you know, we can do a lot with agreements, and there's lawyers who can create documents that say anything. But at the end of the day, you got to look at the substance of what was done and as to whether or not they should be independent contractors or employees, right?
right? I'm not gonna go through statutory employees. So what are the difference in the taxes, right? If you're an employee, employer pays half of the Social Security, and the employer pays half of the Social Security, right? The, the employer withholds the money from the paycheck, you get credit on it, on it that you file a 941, and then you're gonna get your W-2s at the end of the year to give you credit against it on the tax return, right? There's also federal employment taxes, right? That's very important. Somebody gets laid off, they don't have a job, they wanna collect unemployment, right? So you're gonna have that, all right? On the other hand, if you're an employee, I mean, not an employee, an independent contractor, you're gonna pay self-employment tax. That's gonna be on your Schedule C, um, and you're not, what? Your Schedule C, you're gonna play your, your Schedule C, you're gonna compute your self-employment tax. It computes on the schedule on the Form 1040 SE. Right. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, the computation. You, yes, and you get your 1099 MIS, as opposed to your W-2. Okay, again, why is it a problem? Because the government loses, in their mind, lots of money. Frank, yes. they also had, I had a case, believe it or not, where I ended up with one, and then it's seven people that were employees of scores, that were strippers. The IRS came in, this allowed every Schedule C, and not only that, but the, the, the girls lose the deduction for the, the some of them put money into, into SEPs and, and into KEO plans. And There's lots of those out. cases. They, I mean, they, you, the funniest part of this area is there were so many law review articles and cases about whether or not exotic dancers are independent contractors or employees. It's obviously men are doing the audits in these cases, right? Uh, yeah, you offered to sit there and let me through the sample yeah, with me. Yeah, no, but look, and it, again, the cases go all over the lot, right? Because a lot of these women who are the exotic dancers, you know, they decide which club they're gonna go to on which night. They don't go to one club. Right? They know that this club is hot on Friday, this club is hot on Saturday. And they, they make their own hours. They're more like yeah. entertainers. They have their own costumes, right? The, but the other side of it is they have, you know, the, the, the club controls the money and the control of the money. So there are factors that go both ways on those cases. And those are actually cases that show if you, if you, Craft your agreements properly. You can make a difference in the result on these close cases because as, as much as the departments of labor want these people reclassified, they are really the free agents of the trade. I mean, they, they go where the money is. So, and there are, there's great law review, uh, from Rutgers there's a law professor, Jay Soled wrote a law review article on it, we've all, uh, I've had a number of the, the clubs on both ends. So, yeah, I mean, but it, it, it just shows you, it hits every facet of life. Yeah, but yes? He just said his, the steps. They, they just allow because the Schedule C gets I know, allowed. so do they get penalized again for putting the money in? Because I negotiated a deal that they weren't penalized, but they had to amend the returns and uh, well, then take them pull it out. Yeah, again, that's why some of the cases go to tax court, right? You you, you see that there are cases that the, they go to tax court and insist that they want to litigate out the issue, right? There are, the, the other side of this, and one of the cases that I had put on the group was a case called Quintella, that the, the employers, because they were so afraid of reclassification issues, have issued W because they decided it's cheaper for them to comply. They're just taking it out of your paycheck, right? They're charging you for both ends of Social Security. So a lot of employers, especially in the temporary work, but in the Contella case, we're talking about people who go from film to film, have decided they don't want trouble with the taxing authority. They're gonna put you on a W-2, right? But these taxpayers, you know, Contella was one of them, said, wait a second then I'm not getting my deductions. I gotta spend money that I am not reimbursed for. Schedule A, I'm stuck in the alternate minimum tax. I can't have my pension plan. I don't get this deduction. I don't get that deduction. Just because you issued me a W-2 doesn't mean that I agree. Procedure class, we've taught 6201D. 
if the employer, the taxpayer, says, hey, this information report is wrong, the, the firm that sent me the W-2, they should have sent me a 1099. I want to litigate. It's one of the few areas where that shifts the burden of proof back to the government to put on evidence to demonstrate that the third party was right, because the W-2 doesn't come from the government, right? It, it doesn't have the presumption of regularity. It's just the legal opinion of the employer. And the same way you have the ability, when you have a 1099, to go in and say, hey, I'm an employee, I'm going to do a, a substitute for W-2 with a 4852, people who get W-2s have the ability to say, wait a second, these W-2s are wrong. I should be treated as an independent contractor. I'm getting my deductions. And that was what Quintala did. And that's what the tax court is for, right? At the end of the day, there are procedures that allow you to litigate these cases in a prepayment form. Whether we're going to talk about, you know, the 7436 for the employer, right? And there's questions on the tax court exam every year about that. And what's the procedure for the employee? They're going to get a deficiency notice and they can go to tax court. So the tax court is the place where you can litigate these issues in a prepayment form because the fact that the issuers of the information reports take a position one way or the other, whether it's a 1099 in order to save money or whether it's a W-2 because they're too worried and they want to comply, the service provider his or her legal opinion also counts. And the tax court is there to listen and evaluate all the factors that we're talking about so that you get to what the Taxpayer Bill of Rights says, issue number, you know, taxpayer right number three, is to pay only the correct tax and one not, not one dollar more. Okay. So, back to the slides. So, you know, again, the difference, independent contractor versus employee, workers come. Unemployment, minimum wage and overtime, right? A lot of these dancer cases involve minimum wage and overtime. You know, do you get the minimum wage or do you get just your tips, right? You look at the relationships. Discrimination laws, right? Do you get the benefit of the, the protections of being fired for an inappropriate purpose? Collective bargaining rights because you, you're entitled to a union. Um, fringe benefits, all right? There are cases where service providers have been reclassified from independent contractor to employee where they then go back and say, hey, I should have invested in the pension plan. Where is my retirement monies, right? And I've been involved in cases like that where you know people have come in, they've been independent contractors for a company for 20 years. Do that, though, after the fact. Well, one, 20 years should have said to the employer, you got the permanency test right there. If you got the same, but then it was, and it was a defined benefit plan. I mean, it, the difference was a few million dollars. Well, that's why, if you got a problem, the IRS says all of these other programs, like you know, we're all involved in the offshore voluntary disclosure program, there are voluntary disclosure programs that let you correct, you know, without all the the history of the past. But the, the thing that's going to, the thing that changes behavior more than anything is the contingent fee lawyer, right? How many of you have seen cases where the, the, the worker has come in for overtime, even though they were 1099s? or even though they were 1099s, now they got hurt, or they got laid off and they won't. Unemployment, Unemployment. or yeah. work is calm. Oh, there's Frank laughing again. That's a tragedy, Frank. It's a tragedy, it's not a good thing. You took money one way for years, and now you go back and you do something else. It's got to be something that's wrong with that. <laughs> but of course, the government, they just see the money. Right? And, and, I, and then I got to start moving. You know what really makes me crazy? You go in, a guy wants uh, unemployment, and you say, hey, you got a 1099. You can't have unemployment.
But then at the same time you say, let's do an audit of that guy and let's collect all the unemployment. So you take the money from the employer and you never give the guy his unemployment money. So the state is making it on both ends. How can you do that? I know you're retired, but today you're responsible for everything the state of New Jersey does that's wrong. Who's looking over their shoulder? Us! Everyone in this class! We're supposed to bring them to bear. What do we do? We ensure that our clients get every bit of procedural due process that they're entitled to. They still that, favor the employee in every, no matter what. No, happens. not if you litigate. Not if, I mean, that's where you look at the litigations. And the litigations in the tax court cases come out. You know, it's about 50-50. It, there's a, one of the blocks, there's an independent contractor misclassification block that's on there. And you track the cases nationwide. There, there are cases coming out in every different direction in the close calls, right? The common sense cases are common sense cases, right? Somebody comes to work every day, they do what they're told, you're, you're paying them less than minimum wage because they're an undocumented worker and you're taking advantage, right? And that's when the government comes in and those people are punished, right? Because one, they're violating the law, and two, they're taking advantage of people just because of their status, right? And that's not what we collectively are about. But on the close call cases where people go to lawyers, they talk with the clients, right? The, the people who are getting the 1099s, right? They're happy. 59% of them say they like it that way. They think that, why does the government have the ability to come in and tell me how to run my business, whether you're the independent contractor or you're the employee, right? So, and those cases go to court. So you shouldn't say just because the government on audit is coming down employee all the time. Right? You should say, okay, what is the next step? What's happening in the appeals office of the IRS? And we're going to go through that. There's lots of settlement programs. What options are out there, the voluntary compliance programs? And what if your business model depends on the use of the independent contractors? There's the ability to litigate in the tax court. Right? So, and that's why the materials, the, the stuff that we have today, there isn't a bias one way or another. The bias is, let's get the true facts and push our client's position zealously within the bounds of the law. Do you have the site, please? To which case? No, you I said mean, there was a site that you could see. Quintala? That's, it's no, in the materials. Oh, oh, the independent, con no, I, you'd have to email me and I'll put it up. Um, all right, all right. Now, the other side, right, why, from the other side of the, why does the government come in and tell people how to run their business? The other side of that is, you know, businesses that do it right and treat their people as independent contract, I mean employees, when they're really independent contractors are creating a competitive advantage against the ones who do it, uh, I mean, the ones who do it wrong are at a competitive, competitive advantage, the ones who do it right, because we said it's a 40% add-on. Right? If you're violating the law, you could do it cheaper. Right? Same thing, so you're, you're paying less than minimum wage, you could do it cheaper. If you send it offshore, you could do it cheaper. Right? But that's not what we're about. Right? We're about all of the states have you know, a minimum wage, which is what we the people have decided is the living wage, is the minimum that you want people to have. So you don't want firms disrespecting the law, right? Tax professionals encourage voluntary compliance with the law. You know, there, there's no patriotic duty to pay more tax than you owe, right? You're supposed to figure out the correct tax, um, but you can't go over the line because, hey, and the excuse they say, well, look, if I paid everybody on the books, if I paid everybody overtime, uh, then I couldn't be in business. Well, then the law says you shouldn't be in business, right? Because I could make more money if I was robbing banks, but we all know we're not doing that. So, now, and again, one of the points I was going to say is everything is appealable. 
in addition to knowing what you got to do before you file the return, you have to understand how the paper moves inside the IRS because everything is appealable. There are settlement programs, the, the, the CSP that we're going to talk about that have favorable settlements if you've evaluated and said, look, we made a mistake, we want to fix it going forward. There are voluntary compliance uh, programs that if you discover it before the IRS has done it, uh, so there, and there is the ability to litigate. So there are lots of procedures that you need to know in these cases. What are the audit red flags? How are these cases beginning? And a lot of them are beginning just on the sheer number of 1099s, right? You've got a company that's issuing 35, 40 1099s to the same employees each year. So what does that prompt some people to do? Some people say, you know, if the 1099s is the trigger, I'm just gonna stop filing the 1099s. You think that's the right answer? No, because you lose the benefit of all the settlement programs. Section 530 relief, the VSP, the CSP. So not filing, consistent with your position, because you think that your position is going to increase your audit risk is always the wrong answer, right? In some of the cases, the right answer when you get involved is let's file the late 1099s, right? Every, there are lots of people who are worried about it. we're going to file late 1099s. Well, the late 1099 is a lot better than no 1099 <laughs> if you get caught, all right? So at least you've made an attempt at voluntary compliance. And sometimes we're gonna do it in connection with something called the Voluntary Disclosure Program, right? The there's something called the Domestic Voluntary Disclosure Program, you see it on the IRS website, that lets you fix errors like this, right? And sometimes you're gonna fix errors like late 1099s that don't change the tax because you've already done it under the Voluntary Disclosure Program. Right. Um, again, mm -hmm. audit, audit programs, one of the things, wrong and missing tints. Lots of people make up numbers on 1099s, right? Well, you make up the numbers because you didn't get them, right? Or maybe they're undocumented workers or whatever, right? Bad strategy. There's lots of computers. They try to match up the numbers, right? They're trying to match up the number on a 1099 to a tax return so that there is matching, right? Matching creates voluntary compliance. Making up numbers, that's a guarantee. Not a, it's not 100% guarantee, but that's definitely a way to get your return looked at because the computer has to spit it out and a live body looks at it and you're starting to get letters. So whoever you know, thinks that just making up numbers because you have to have a number, yes? Is it the independent contractor that raise his hand? Hey, I didn't make a thousand dollars. I want to make it six, seven hundred. Okay, that happens a lot. That's going to be like in ten days at the issue of ten ninety nine. So what? What's the? No, that happens. No, you know what happens? Okay, one true independent contractors get more than one ten ninety nine. So when you aggregate the number of ten ninety nines and you compare it to the gross receipts on the return, the computer doesn't spit that out, right? The the audits happen a couple of different ways. One, the, the mismatches. Two, when the number of 1099s and dollar amounts of the 1099 greatly exceed the reported AGI on Schedule C. And that happens a lot, okay? And the, the reason that happens is two, right? One is straight tax evasion. Right? How many clients, I mean, John and I had clients, right? That's how it started. Because the client had more 1099 income than gross receipts. Right? How can that be? Duplicate 1099s, except they were all from different sources. So that, that defense goes away. Um, so that's one way it happens. Two, what are we seeing in tax court? Um, there's a lot of companies that just plug the number on the temporary employees on the 1099 to, to manage their tax risk, right? 
So you're preparing a return. There are preparers. They're preparing returns. They know that they have lots of 1099s, and they think that these 1099 guys work for multiple people. So they'll just add a thousand dollars to everybody's 1099. How does that can get caught? Because if these people are working for multiple employees, the thousand dollars are not going to get caught. Right? And then they manage the corporate income because they've reduced it by the amount of the 1099s. Right? We're involved, I, one of our funniest cases we're involved in, there's a firm, two accounting firms. One accounting firm has clients that have disproportionate number of earned income credit returns. The other accounting firm has lots of small businesses. So these two accounts got together and they said, look, how can we all help each other? My guys need 1099s because they need to max out the credit. Your guys need to issue 1099s because they want to take the deductions, right? And we'll each charge our respective clients a percentage of the tax savings. So they're providing a service for everybody. <laughs> and they were able to get away with this for years. Is that on Broadway? Excuse me? Is that on Broadway? Yeah, that on Broadway. No, it's actually in Islin, New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> But 